with you in our first lecture on heat conduction, we looked at the theory that was general, but most of our applications were one-dimensional. In other words, line elements for heat conduction. Now we'd like to get into two dimensions. Also, I'd like to review the variables that are involved and show some of the mappings between the various heat conduction vectors. We'll end up with a small problem session. Let's discuss the variables involved in heat conduction. You may have done classical heat conduction before, and often flux is considered a vector-like quantity. We're going to concentrate our attention on what happens at nodes, and so for us, flux is more often a scalar, and it's positive into a point and negative out of the point. We can make also equivalent nodal fluxes that come from volumetric or surface flux by integrating over that relevant domain. Let's review the structural notation that we've used earlier in this course. We had the nodal quantities, the U displacement, and the F force, and their product was work. We had uh, strain and stress, and their product was work per volume. It was strain energy density. We had the distributed forces in uh, one, two, and three dimensions that uh, when multiplied times the field displacement gives the work for whatever spatial dimensions that is. Now, we didn't work so much with the generalized coordinates multiplied by generalized forces over here. It was the generalized forces that we really didn't exploit. Those are um, such as Argyris's natural modes. They're methods that aren't used so much anymore, so I haven't concentrated on that. But the interesting thing is that you can identify energies here or work done by looking at a quantity in blue uh, multiplied by a quantity in red. So you have a displacement-like thing and a force-like thing. Also, we had equivalent nodal loads that were made by doing the proper spatial integral of the distributed force. Now, these concepts aren't quite as obvious in heat conduction, but there are similar situations. For heat conduction, we can also form work by multiplying the relevant quantities. On the right, we have the temperatures, and on the left, we have the fluxes. Here we have the nodal temperatures, and over to the left, the nodal fluxes. So their product is work. Then we have distributed fluxes, both volumetric and surface. And then we have the field temperature. And their product is the work uh, per space or per dimension over which the integration is to be taken. And that integration is shown here to convert from a distributed flux into an equivalent nodal flux. We need to do this integral multiplying the distributed quantity times the field displacement is characterized by the shape function. Let's review the dimensions and units that are used in thermal problems. Temperature doesn't have a universal symbol. I might suggest a theta here, which is often seen. But it can be in English, in Rankine or Fahrenheit, or in metric in Kelvin or Celsius degrees. The remaining quantities are similar as to the mechanical problems using the conventional dimensions, length, time, energy, and power, and then having that either in the English or in the metric units here. Of course, metric is winning big worldwide, and uh, many Americans are coming over to metric now, and you'll notice that I'm using it more and more in my, my notes. When I was in graduate school at the master's level at Iowa State, there was quite an emphasis on similitude, which was the idea of finding analogies in different fields. And so we often found ourselves using an electrical network to represent a fluid system and uh, a mechanical system to represent electrical and so on. And there is quite a comparison between this thermal and the mechanical problem area. Um, 
for instance, I'm going to compare structural mechanics and heat transfer. Uh, and if you take this analogy, you'll take the displacement and the temperature as corresponding, then velocity. And in heat transfer, the rate of change of temperature is a uh, time change of temperature. The acceleration that is in structural mechanics really has no equivalent over in the thermal problem because the second derivatives are not important. Stiffness would play the role of thermal conductance in heat transfer. Damping is uh, played by heat capacity. There is no mass analogy in the thermal problem in the way we're making the analog. And the applied load is indeed a thermal load. And you will see the term thermal load used quite a bit in the finite element codes. My goal in this lecture is to progress from one-dimensional heat conduction into two-dimensional. We're not going to do much with three-dimensional, but I think the uh, progression is clear. Now, in two dimensions, one of the easiest elements is the triangle. And it helps if we start with a simple triangle, namely the right triangle. I regard this as a special case uh, because of the simplicity of the triangle itself. What I'm going to do is calculate one of the relevant heat conduction coefficients, K33, and show equivalent fluxes for the distributed flux shown that's on the edge of the element. The element has thickness H. In our previous lecture, we developed the three-dimensional law for the heat conduction coefficients. Now we'll specialize it to two dimensions. And here we have an integral over the volume of the body, but that's represented by the thickness of the material times its area. We don't need the derivatives in the z direction, but we do have these x and y derivatives. The shape functions occur naturally in the ij pairs in the same way as the uh, coefficient has its indices. You can see that the whole stiffness depends upon the shape functions, and those in this case are going to be plane surfaces in the same way that the Turner Triangle was developed. I've sketched one of them here, namely N3, which is one of the simpler ones, because it has a unit elevation over node 3, and that is quite easily found to be y over c, where c is the uh, y-coordinate out at node 3. Then the other two are also found in like manner. The first shape function, of course, depends on the equation of the line here. We'll calculate the term k33, and it depends on the third shape function only. It has the derivatives both on x and y shown here. Now, um, N3, quite simply, was the quantity y over c. And so when you take a derivative on x, these terms drop out and give us 0. The derivatives on y give you 1 over c squared. This, this is a constant, and you shouldn't be surprised because this is a constant gradient triangle. Uh, you end up integrating the area with these constants out front. The area becomes ultimately the um, base times the height divided by 2. And then upon simplifying, you get the expression for K33, KHB over 2C. Now, we could continue this for the other coefficients in the matrix, but I'll show those in general for the uh, general triangle a little later. Let's calculate the equivalent nodal flux due to the distributed flux on the left boundary of the element. The general integral over surface involves the flux and then the surface area in this case. Our surface area is the thickness of the material times the differential height. The flux at that surface is constant, Q0. And then we have to evaluate the shape functions on that left boundary. This is actually um, an integral on that line where the load is applied.
then when we carry that out, we'll put in the coordinates on the line, 0 and y for x and y. Uh, that leaves the first shape function in the form 1 minus y over c. The second shape function is identically 0 along that line. The third shape function is y over c. We carry out the integration term by term in that vector. It involves values of y, and then those integrate into y squared. The second component is 0. And then we find these equivalent nodal fluxes. Now, the components themselves are just scalars that are positive into the nodes in question. The fact that there's no equivalent nodal flux into the remote node over here has to do with the fact that the second shape function is zero along this boundary. As a result, that boundary flux can do no work on that particular shape function, and therefore uh, we have no equivalent nodal flux due to it at node two. After doing that right triangle, I decided, gee, we really need the general case, just as we did in structures. So I set up this triangle with a certain um, special or element coordinate system centered below the vertex. And now I allow for coordinate minus a at this left node and plus b at the right node, giving a base of a plus b and then a coordinate of c for the y-coordinate at the upper vertex, so the altitude is c. And after turning the crank quite a few times, you end up with this matrix for heat conduction. And that's general then for any triangular constant gradient heat conduction triangle. Our first problem is one where we take a right triangle heat conduction element and put a known flux in at one node and then ask what the temperature results at that node. This is a three-noted constant gradient triangle. We put 100 watts in at the top node, holding the bottom two nodes at zero degrees Celsius. And what temperature does the node number three reach after a long time? Now, this means we're looking at a static problem, so it's a steady state problem. I give some physical values for the material of this triangle. It's a one millimeter thick triangle. You can see the dimension here, the altitude and the base of the triangle. Here's an expansion coefficient, and here's a heat conduction coefficient. I found over the years when you put in extraneous information such as the expansion coefficient that students really can panic and I think professors need to do more of that. I, I really feel that we don't let our students get the um, exposure to real world problems enough where there's extraneous information, there's lack of information. And so that was an attempt to uh, add irrelevant information. Now we had found that coefficient K33 for the right triangle, so we're in good shape. We can write out the heat conduction matrix. We've held the first two nodes to be zero and allowed the third one to take some unknown value. And then we've imposed over on the right the 100 watts of flux. So solving this is a straightforward problem with this coefficient times this unknown to be equal to this known. And you just solve for U3, putting in the proper terms, the heat conduction coefficient and the dimensions, and you end up with 20 degrees Celsius. In the body of this lecture, I gave the heat conduction matrix for the general isotropic triangle. Now I'd like to go through a calculation, though, just to show how that uh, would be done in, in detail. We'll only do one term, but you'll see that it's quite intricate. 
I've posed this problem in sort of an inverse way by asking the following question, that if you have this triangle and it's an isotropic material, constant thickness H, and if you raise the temperature at node 1 by 1 unit in temperature and then hold nodes 2 and 3 at 0 temperature, what is the heat flux into node 2 that's required to maintain this situation? Now, in effect, what I'm really asking for is the term K21 because that's the, uh, it's the uh, heat that's required at node 2 to maintain a one unit temperature rise at node 1. We have the general expression for the heat conduction matrix, so we can find K21 rather quickly. Here is the expression, and we need to be able to take derivatives on N2 and N1 by both X and Y. First, though, we need to figure out the shape functions, and uh, those are a little tougher now in this uh, general triangle. First of all, N1 uh, would have to raise this node over here one unit and would have to pass through zero on the far side, making use of that equation. So I do that here in the product form. You then evaluate that at the left node and set it to be unity, and thereby letting you calculate what the uh, magnification factor, capital C, is. And here's the scale factor that we find. So that gives us our first shape function. Now we need to take derivatives of that function with respect to both x and y, and I show those derivatives here, and then try to simplify them a bit. So these are two of the four uh, ingredients needed in the integration. The second shape function is found in a similar way using the product form. Again, we leave a scale factor and then the equation of the relevant line. We evaluate the shape function at its home node where it has unit value, put in the coordinates of the second node, solve for the constant, and then reinsert that into the shape function expression. Then we need the two derivatives, both on x and y, and those are done here and then slightly simplified. We now have all the terms in the integral. So here we can find our coefficient K21, having calculated these four needed quantities. In fact, those are all constants, and so that the integral over the volume becomes that integrand, and the thickness of the triangle and the area of the triangle are the volume contribution. We put the terms in, simplify, put them over a common denominator ultimately at the bottom, and that gives us our coefficient K21. This is only one of the heat conduction coefficients, and there are some six independent coefficients in the symmetric 3x3 three three matrix, but the others are carried out uh, in a similar manner and then yield the uh, matrix that we showed earlier in the lecture. So that finishes our discussions on heat conduction. Our final lecture in this lecture series is basically an introduction to dynamics and to nonlinear problems. I think it would be good for everyone having seen these lectures to realize what the extension of this course would be. Now, linear dynamics is perhaps the most easy extension, particularly the eigenvalue problem that is the normal mode problem because that literally only involves adding about five cards to a static data set in order to get the normal modes of a structure.
A second area, though much broader, is that of nonlinear problems. And there you can have all kinds of weird nonlinearities, material and geometric and boundary condition. So we'll talk about these two uh, extensions in turn. Let's consider dynamics. Really, this is what would be called structural dynamics. And what we want to do is take our same linear structures that we've been solving, but apply some time-dependent force. This will make the whole system jiggle and oscillate and add a lot of interest to the structural response. Now, basically, you have this expression for displacement field now, where this is the field displacement, and I mean it to be written uh, or understood as a function of time. Likewise, the nodal coordinates become functions of time. The kind of interpolation that we did before to find the field displacement as a function of the nodal displacements now is written in a separation of variables form, where the spatial dependence is separated from the time dependence. And this isn't obvious. It's one way to do it, and it turns out to be very robust. In other words, as long as your elements are small, this really works. And the, and the separation of the space and the time problems helps us to solve many, many structural dynamics problems. The one limitation is that within a single element, you have synchronous motion. That is, every point in, within an element will sense what's going on at all of the surrounding nodes and will immediately react. Therefore, if you have propagation problems where they're wave-like events, you have to have enough small elements so that the lag in response can be accomplished element to element and doesn't need to be accomplished within one single element. In linear structural dynamics, the character of the response is often governed by the character of the loading. Let me sketch five possible types of loading here. First of all, the harmonic load. Now, that would be a sine wave, say, acting on a structure. And I'll use red for the um, force that's acting on the structure. Then the response for the system at rest might follow a curve that would initially be um, perhaps not sinusoidal, but with time probably will become a true sine wave with some lag in response. Periodic problems are where you have a forcing function that itself could be Fourier analyzed and broken into its components. So this sawtooth wave might have a certain amount of energy in each of the uh, several of these sine waves. Then the response can be found in a series form. Transient problems are where you have a sudden spike of force, let's say. This could be an automobile hitting a curb or an aircraft hitting a sharp edge gust. The response here would be that typically the structure, depending on the frequency response of the structure, would receive enough of a boost that it would do some kind of motion afterwards. If there were damping in the system, then this would die out in time. The fourth case that I mention is stationary random loading. This would be characteristic of turbulence acting on the lift of an airplane's wing. Many of you have had rough airplane rides and you know how that can happen. Luckily, this is uh, rather straightforward to handle, and you do it in a statistical way by average response due to average random force characteristics. Lastly, I show a truly random loading, and that's impossible to handle because you cannot even predict in the future what it would be like. You could do this in an experimental way by measuring such a load uh, pattern and then doing a simulation uh, over the time. And uh, an example would be if you bought a pair of shoes and they were sitting on a shelf for a while for a time, and then you walked home with them and kicked tin cans and scuffed them and so on. Then at home you took them off and set them down and perhaps someone turned on a, a hot plate nearby and heated it up and then it cooled down and so on. And a truly random force field is really difficult to characterize just because of that uh, true randomness. <laughs> 
And generally speaking, people will choose the worst portion of an expected uh, forcing character such as this and then do perhaps a stationary random study of this region, let's say, and then a deterministic uh, study in some other region if they're able to break the loading into such pieces. The systems that we study uh, can be of several types, and they can exhibit several general classes of response. Um, this is distinct from the loading that we showed earlier. For instance, the system itself could involve rigid body motion, or it could involve elastic motion, or a combination of the two. For instance, a vehicle rolling on a highway, such as this one on the left, is showing rigid body motion. And there are many courses in universities for vehicle performance that really limit themselves to rigid vehicles. For instance, in the aeronautical area, if you're looking at flight mechanics and you study the, um, the mode called the fugoid mode, which is a long-term uh, longitudinal mode of motion, that is done by assuming that the aircraft is rigid. And similar things would happen in the automotive area if you were interested perhaps in gasoline mileage and their hills and valleys, you probably would assume a rigid automobile. On the other hand, many fields will have bodies that are restrained and the only way they can move is through elastic motion as shown on the right. And this means that the body as a whole cannot translate or rotate freely. There are combinations of the two. One of them that has come up in aeronautics in the last 10 years has been something called a body freedom flutter, where for many years people had studied the wing as if it were purely an elastic motion leading to what has been called wing divergence. But in recent times, at least two people have shown no indeed, if you consider the way that the fuselage can move up and down, that the uh, airplane really will suffer a kind of flutter before it hits the wing divergence. So there was a case where the failure to include both types of motion led to really the wrong results. All right, now another thing that one might consider besides those system characteristics is um, whether you're going to look at the body's motion under purely a forcing function that is externally applied, or whether you're going to look at the body under its own self-generated motion. These are generally called forced vibration and free vibration. And I think that distinction is pretty obvious. There is a borderline case that causes me some trouble in teaching this, and that's a case of a body that has been displaced initially and then allowed to respond by its own internal forces. Is that a forced response or is that a free response, a free vibration? Well, every free vibration indeed needs some kind of a start such as that. So, uh, but on the other hand, many people would like to view that as a force vibration problem if you're really going to look at it, especially in the transient uh, case. So I think you have to tell from the context of the problem whether a displacement controlled initial condition is to be viewed more as a free or a force vibration. Uh, it won't be a problem for us in this little discussion. I'd like to show the equations of motion for systems, and I'd like to show it for the forced vibration and then the free vibration. Most dynamics problems that are discrete can be posed in a matrix form such as this, and you will have a mass matrix that characterizes the inertia forces in the problem and a damping matrix that will uh, typically act on a velocity term and then a stiffness matrix, which we've looked at closely before. So we've already looked in the linear static problem at this uh, pair of terms here, uh, except that we've now made the forcing function a function of time, which is new. In total, this is called a response problem because, generally speaking, your attention starts at the force on the right and then you move to the left and you wonder what kind of a response will you get in the displacement, velocity, and acceleration. Uh, 
Now, if we want to study um, the so-called normal mode problem, uh, it's a kind of free vibration, uh, then we're going to arrive at what, what is called an eigenvalue problem. And we get that by setting the damping zero and the external force zero. So in the above problem, um, I will knock out this middle term here and the right term here. Now you're left then with a balance between the stiffness of the system and the inertia of the system. And uh, this has become uh, a specialized problem, an eigenvalue problem, where you get self-maintained motion. You find that the energy alternately trades back and forth between kinetic energy due to inertia and then the uh, potential energy or strain energy here um, due to the stiffness of the body. The form, if you assume a response that's harmonic so that there's a spatial distribution of displacements at the nodes, let's say, times cosine omega t, you will then get this equation below where the omega comes out because of the two derivatives and forms this problem that's often called the general eigenvalue problem. I'll further break down those two mathematical problems into these subcases. In the response problem, which involved the forcing function, you can deal with frequency response. It has to do with harmonic uh, loading, typically, um, or a, a periodic function that can be harmonically analyzed. You can deal with transient response, which typically involves numerical integration in time, or you can deal with statistical approaches with random response. And many computer programs will handle all three of these. Certainly, um, most of them will handle the first two in finite elements. And then the third one, even when it's handled, is handled with different degrees of success because it's somewhat of a specialty area. Now what I found is that the automotive and aircraft industries do a lot of work in frequency response and some work in transient. And then the missile industry does a lot of work on random. And I think that has to do with the noise field from the rocket engines. Now the other math problem is the eigenvalue problem. And typical conventional structures with placid loading that we're used to would form the real eigenvalue problem and require a real eigenvalue analysis. But if you have exotic loading, such as follower loads or aerodynamic loads, usually fluids flowing over a structure will cause complex eigenvalues. And that means that you can get motions that are not just happy to be um, self balancing in time, but rather will grow in time or subside in time because of energy either being put into or taken out of the system.